Hey everyone, welcome to the third in this, um, what has turned into being a little bit of a mini-series on trust. Uh, in the first video we talked about the four pillars of trust model and identified what those four pillars were and I went into a bit of detail around um, the first of those pillars which is competency and the fact that your boss, your peers, your team will judge competency not based on what you think is important, but on whether or not you can solve the problems that they see. And I shared a little story about an IT team uh, that had to sort of work through the fact that actually it wasn't at all about the technology platform that they were picking. It was about whether or not they could solve the business problem that they'd been presented with. So that was video one. And then last week, I did a little video where I shared with you my very basic first step uh, visual management tool around setting up a wall space and a visual management space for any kind of delivery program. Anything where you've got to take an idea and turn it into fruition. Uh, so that was, that was the little screen share that we did last week. And that'll work no matter what industry you're in. Whether you're building software or you're selling houses, or whatever it is that you're doing. If you're trying to take an idea to value for your customers, that little visual management tool and that delivery tool will work really, really well. So this week I wanted to talk about the third pillar, which is character. So often when people talk to me about uh, maybe some dysfunction in the team uh, or somebody that they're finding to be a really tricky stakeholder, and we go through this idea of four pillars of trust, it's not uncommon for character to present as the reason why we don't trust someone. Um, and it's it's not even as harsh as saying, well, I just don't really like that person. You know, it could be it could be as simple as saying, well, they're not really my type of person, or I don't work that way. Or, you know, it's it's this thing about them, it's you know, it's not it's not really me, maybe it's them, it's not you, it's me, all of that weirdness. And so what I often do is encourage people to go back through, and we will talk and debrief through the other three of four pillars, uh, and often we can find something there to work with, with this particular stakeholder. But what happens if you've gone through all of that and you're still at the same point, and you're fairly certain that it's just a character thing, what do we, where do we go from there? Well, today I wanted to share with you a mind hack that I use when I find myself in this situation. So if I've been through disclosure, competency, consistency, and I feel like I've ticked those three boxes, I'm still not quite getting the result that I would like, or the relationship's not where it needs to be with this particular person or team, then what I often jump into is a conversation or some thinking around communication style. So for those of you that have been in any of my premium programs, you'll know that I have a tool that I love to use, which helps you to understand your communications profile, your preferences and the way that you choose words and the way that you structure them and put them together. Really great uh, tool from the Cantor Institute. And I, I love it. It's, it's not so much about that tool. What is really useful is finding a tool that can help you to unlock in your head what I'm about to share with you and what I've helped to unlock with my clients with the Cantor tool. So part of the Cantor profile, when you go through their system and you do the, um, you do the profiling mechanism, they have part of their tool which they call your um, communication propensity. And what that's about is it's about those topics or those areas that you tend to focus on, that you tend to gravitate naturally towards, and the fact that your language will tend to reflect that. And what I've found is that this has been a really powerful little way for me to think about communication style. So in my own profile, I show up as very high in one of the three potential areas known as affect. So affect is all about people-based language. So you'll often hear me if I'm in an office, if I'm working with a team, I'll be talking about where's this person's head at? How are they feeling? Have we brought this person on the journey? Have we thought about the wider group? It's very people-focused language. And in some circles, that can 
come off as sounding a little soft or, um, you, you know, maybe not quite so hard hitting. So the other two propensities that you, you could be strong in, um, the first is meaning. So if you are very high in meaning in this particular tool, what it means is that you tend to use language around, help me understand, what data do you have to support that? Have you thought about, help me dig into, oh, what happens if we went this way? It's all about getting to the core of the understanding. And so you'll find people naturally have that language and that structure around where they tend to dive in. And it's based on that curiosity and that that hooking in and that understanding and, and discerning meaning. And then the third propensity is uh, it, in the tool itself, they call it power. And the way I describe it to people is it's around very action oriented language. This is the person who at the end of the meeting wants to know what the dot points are, who's got what action, what are we doing next, when are we meeting, next steps, when's this due, action oriented language. And now if you think about that at the, the kind of extreme end, that language can come across as very direct, almost cold, and, and potentially quite harsh and quite calculating. And so as someone who doesn't have that natural propensity in their language and who has a more people-oriented approach in a business context where, uh, you know, sometimes we're having to make tough decisions, I've personally found that if I start to dig into the communication style of the person that I'm working with, I've often got a lot there that I can start to play with to help to unlock where some of that uh, mistrust is coming through and what I might think to be a character sort of area of, of the four pillars. So if you're getting stuck and you think it's character, my recommendation would be to go back to um, a communication tool that you work with, that you know and that you love, that helps you understand your natural preferences and behaviors, and then dig into what you think the natural preferences and behaviors of that other tricky stakeholder might be. Because what that does is all of a sudden you go from a very binary, it's working or it's not with this person, to opening the doors for here's a number of different avenues that I could work on or I could try and go down with this person to see if that helps to shift things along. Um, and in my experience, it's usually what does the trick. You, you don't necessarily have to love people at the end of it, but you do need to get to a civilized working relationship where nobody's being traumatized, but where you can get along and you can get done what needs to be done, um, and that both of you aren't blocking each other or creating a, a severe amount of angst or, you know, potentially creating that dysfunction in the in the team, whether it's your core team or your wider team. And so uh, I'll leave you with homework, and that is that if you find yourself in a position where you think that character is the pillar of trust that needs work, go back, look at yourself, look at what your personal preferences are, Try and do a bit of an understanding of where that person might be at and start to look for those avenues where you can see a gap or where you might be able to bridge that gap. Where you're able to maybe may be able to match up, maybe you've got some areas of commonality and you can start to build on that. So wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful, wonderful day and uh, we'll see you next week.